Hello brothers and sisters in Christ, are you looking Sound Doctrine Liberty Part 3? Okay, make sure that, I hope that you followed along in Part 1 and Part 2 of what true liberty is, okay? Um, true liberty is what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Remember, the law of sin and death. The Jews would hit Jesus up and say, have you come to... Uh, abolish the laws, do away with the laws? Have you come to change the laws? And he said, I haven't come to, ch to do away with the laws, I came to fulfill the law. The law of sin and death. The ultimate consequences of sin, what does the Bible say? The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Okay, what did Jesus do? He died on the cross to pay the ultimate price. That's where we get our liberty from through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why in order to have true liberty that the Bible talks about, it's, you have to be in Christ Jesus our Lord, a real Christian. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means it be in Christ. And there's a lot of fakes and frauds out there, I understand that. But that's what true liberty is. Now we're getting into part three here. Turn to Galatians chapter five, verse 13. Galatians five thirteen. We're gonna read this real quick. Galatians 5.13 For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love, serve one another. We're supposed to be a servant to one another. And I'm going to bring this up real quick, just real quick, and then we're going to move on. There's been a big division in the body of Christ over Christmas. Okay? I backed a man into the corner, and he admitted that Christmas has no basis in Scripture. It's just traditions of men. It's just culture. And that man had a choice to make. To serve himself and be worldly, or by love serve one another. Give it up to be a good servant to the brethren. And it's not just Christmas. It could be a lot of things. Okay? Things that get in the way of your fellowship with the, with the Lord Jesus Christ first. I'll say it there. Things that get in the way of your fellowship with the Lord. Remember what the Bible says? Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I knew a brother in Christ that taught uh, this once. Uh, said that that doesn't mean you can't love a good pizza. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that you can't love a good, beautiful walk out in nature. It means, do you love things down here on this earth more than you love the Lord Jesus Christ? By love, serve one another. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Worldliness comes in. And the world, your flesh, in this world, starts to come first before anything else. It comes first before the ministry. It comes first before your fellowship, for the men that are in ministry. It comes first before your fellowship with the brethren. I see brethren turning on each other left and right. Why? So this can come first. Be very careful, that last part. But by love, serve one another. What happened to true charity in the Bible is self-sacrifice. There was a brother in Christ that did a great study called, uh, Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Okay, are things down here more important than things up there? The Bible talks about we're supposed to mind high things. We're not supposed to be so focused on the temporal, which is temporary, this physical life that we have down here, temporary. We're supposed to be focused on eternity with Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be earning rewards in heaven, not getting what we want down here. Living our dream life down here. Okay, living the way we want to live, doing things our way. We're supposed to be doing things God's way. Remember that, okay? But by love, serve one another. But it says here, liberty for an occasion of the flesh. And you know what some people say, brothers of Christ? They'll say, oh, this just means to an excess. As long as you don't take things. This is just talking about taking things to an excess. Things that are okay, you know, eating. You can eat. In fact, the body needs food. Okay, you're supposed to eat right. But, you know, we already talked about that. One of the perverting of liberty is saying that it's a choice. It's what you're doing. It's not what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. It's what you're doing, and it's just a choice. And we can, and it's, we can agree to disagree. And one of the things we can agree to disagree is on what we can eat. And that's not true. I've already debunked that. It's not true. There's certain things you shouldn't eat, brothers of Christ. This is supposed to be a body. Your body's supposed to, I'm sorry, body. This is supposed to be a temple for the Holy Ghost. You're supposed to, the physical temple. Your body's a physical temple. You're to take care of it. You're not supposed to have tattoos. If you do, cover them up, brothers of Christ. 
Don't get any when you're saved. Once you get saved and born again, you don't get any more tattoos. You don't do any more body piercings. Okay? You watch what you eat and you take care of your body. Okay? Some of us need to work harder on that than others. Okay? Taking care of the temple is the Holy Ghost. But the point is, what they're trying to make it out to be, they change liberty and say, well, this passage here, especially when it says it's occasion for the flesh, it just means not to an excess. We're supposed to eat, but you're not to eat to an excess. We're supposed to sleep, but you're not supposed to sleep to an excess. Okay? We can do things and enjoy things in this world. We just don't, aren't supposed to do it to an excess. That's what this is talking about. It's just not doing anything to an excess. Because when you do something to an excess, then it becomes sin. But it wasn't sin to begin with. Is that what this is talking about? No. This is actually talking about sin. And I've taught this, and I've gotten kicked by brethren. And you guys need to check... Look in the mirror and check yourselves. Check your relationship with the Lord. Make sure that this is coming first and you're thinking of eternity things and not temporal things. Okay, a lot of times I get kicked by brethren on this because they're fleshly and they're worldly and they're trying to use their false liberty to justify it, what they're doing. But uh, turn to Romans chapter 6.1. I'm going to prove this because we're going to stay in chapters. Keep your hand in chapters, Galatians chapter 5. I pray you guys read all of Galatians like I asked as homework because Galatians pretty much sums up what liberty is and what it means to use liberty for an occasion to the flesh. And that's what we're going to go through. But we're going to be comparing Scripture with Scripture. Okay? Was the Galatians the only ones having problem with using liberty as an occasion to the flesh? No, they weren't. It's not limited to just the church of Galatia. Okay? It was also in Romans, Romans 6 1. Turn to Romans chapter 6, keep your hand there. But Romans, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Okay, we're going to read down to 7. It says here, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? See, the Galatians weren't the only ones that were using liberty as an occasion to the flesh. He's saying, okay, now that we're saved, we're born again. Jesus has paid the ultimate price of sin and death. He's paid it. Okay. He paid the ultimate price. When we sin as a saved sinner, we're not going to go to hell anymore. So is sin now okay? Is it okay to just live by the flesh, to live worldly, and just say, I believe, believe in a big guy upstairs? But mainly for saved, he's talking to saved people. He's addressing saved people, saved sinners, saved sinners. Okay, is sin now okay? Is there a certain level of tolerance that we can have for sin now all of a sudden? That's what's it. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Oh, God paid it all. We can just sin all we want. It's under the blood. You know, God will forgive me. I, I'm going to purposely do this sin and just say, God will forgive me. Is that how we're supposed to live as, as Bible-believing, God-fearing, church of God, saved sinners, saints, okay? Brothers and sisters in Christ, is that how we're supposed to live? Verse 2, God forbid. How, the, how, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ, the new man is raised. True biblical repentance. You know what separates you, brothers and sisters of Christ, from all these other, the lost world and fake Christians? This right here. The true biblical repentance, the changed heart. You have a, an attitude of sorrow when you sin against God. You don't want to sin anymore. You don't, want, you don't try to justify sin at all. You don't want to sin anymore. And when you fail the Lord, you have your head hung down. Why do you think King David was a man after God's own heart? He had true biblical repentance. He had godly sorrow for the th times that he failed the Lord. He had godly sorrow in his heart when other people failed the Lord. Okay, he we wept with them. Right, there's part in the Bible that talks about weep with them that weep, cry with them that cry. Right. He had a love of God and doing things God's way. And when he failed, he had that heartfelt conviction and that sorrow in his heart towards God, which made him a man after God's own heart. How are we to live it any longer therein, the changed life? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Don't you guys, don't forget what Jesus Christ had to pay because of your sins, is what he's saying. 
And there are brethren out there that are starting to forget that. Do you not remember what Jesus Christ had to go through to pay for your sins? Have you forgotten? Have you been starting to get so worldly and so sinful and wicked in this world as a saved sinner that you've forgotten what Jesus Christ went through to pay the, law, to pay the ultimate price to fulfill the law of sin and death? The wages of sin is death. He died. And it wasn't just, oh, he dead, just one second, dead. No, he was beaten. He had his beard ripped out. Beaten within an inch of his life. He bled out on the cross. He was spit on. He was reviled. People who once said, I love you. How many of you had that? I've had that. My mentor said, I love you, brother. I'm here for you, brother. I'm praying for you, brother. And the next minute, I hate you, brother. I despise you, brother. You're false. You're not even a brother. You're, you're just a, a, you know, a heretic. You're false. You have people spit at you and turn on you just like that. Jesus had everybody turn on him. Everyone. Do you remember what Jesus Christ went through to pay for your sins? We're baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him in baptism of death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. The new man. We're supposed to have a zero tolerance for sin in our life. We're supposed to have a zero tolerance for the world going against God's way. And doing things, they're always going to do things contrary to what God wants in God's way. Our heartfelt desire is to have a zero tolerance for sin, now, we still are going to sin sometimes, brothers and Christ. I'm not talking about sinless perfection. I'm talking about our heartfelt desire. It's here that matters. Because if it's here, it'll reflect with the life you're living. It'll reflect out here. Your heart will reflect out here. The life you live. That heartfelt desire, I don't want to sin against God anymore. And when you do fail Him, you hang your head down low and you repent. And you get, get, remember what the Bible says? If a man come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. Repentance. you got to have that sorrow. Deny yourself. You have to have that sorrow. I was, I was wrong. I did wrong. I was filthy. I was wicked. Lord, please forgive me. Repentance. Pick up that cross. Look back to the cross. You died for me, O oh Lord. Why am I doing this? Why am I living this way? Why am I doing things this way? You forsake it, and you get back to your walk with the Lord. Okay? The new man. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, okay, spiritually and physically. Spiritually, we're part of his resurrection right now. That's why we got the new man, the new Christ, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to be in Christ. But physically someday, remember, we're only two-thirds redeemed. Our body, our body isn't redeemed. We still have this wicked body of flesh to deal with. Okay? But someday we will have that resurrection, that physical bodily resurrection. Right? Uh, this uh, immortal shall put on immortality, and this uh, corruption shall put on incorruption. That day is going to come. It's the catching away of the body of Christ. Are you looking? That's the whole point of this. When you take your eyes off Jesus Christ, you start messing up liberty. You start getting worldly. And when you start getting worldly, you start perverting liberty to justify your worldliness. And you start using liberty, you either pervert liberty to justify, which we already talked about, to justify your worldliness and doing things your way, or you're one of those people that use liberty as an occasion for the flesh, and we're getting into that. Okay? That just say, well, it's under the blood. They start having a more of a tolerance for sin. Sin's, not, sin's bad, but eh, it's, okay. it's okay. so Because, you know, Jesus died for our sins, and it's under the blood. Paul's saying, no, we're supposed to still have a zero tolerance for sin. And anytime we fail the Lord in sin, we're supposed to look back to the cross. It's supposed to be a reminder of what Jesus Christ went through. And it's not supposed to be a physical cross and it becomes an idol. It's talking about spiritually, we're to look back. We're all supposed to be carrying a cross. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Remember what uh, Paul said in Romans 8. Okay, Being carnally minded and walking after the flesh is someone who's lost. Their heartfelt desires all based off the flesh and worldliness. 100% solely. 
Okay, that's what motivates them. Someone who's truly saved is capital S spirit comes in, and you're capital S spiritually minded, and you're walking after the spirit. And while you're walking after the spirit, Paul also talked about where he talks about how with the law of God I might serve Christ, but with the law of sin, because we're still under the law of sin, like I said, this body, we still have this body of wicked sin. I might serve the flesh sometimes, you're going to sin sometimes, but my heartfelt desire is always to serve God. That's what he's talking about in that passage. I'm here to serve God. And when I fail, because I'm still under the law of sin, and there's times where I'm going to give in to this flesh and do something stupid, something I know I shouldn't be doing. But with my heart, with this flesh, I should say it like that, and then with my heart, I'm still serving God. I love the Lord. Okay? And I'm trying to put down the flesh. When it rises up and gets the better of me, I'm trying to put it back down. That's what this is talking about. So, and people say, well, but Galatians, it's not talking about sin. Well, yeah, we're going to keep going. Let's keep going. Remember context. Some brethren have a hard time with context, context today. Comparing scripture with scripture. They have a hard time with words have meaning. You know, we've already talked about that in some of the studies, you know. They leave out the word one day. They leave out the word day unto the Lord. They leave out the word week. They'll leave out the word working, like working of miracles. They'll leave certain words out or change the definitions of them. Let's get the context here. Galatians chapter 5. Go back to Galatians chapter 5. And I took my hand out. <laughs> Galatians chapter 5. Let's keep going. They say, like I said, I threw that verse in there to say, hey, was Galatians the only ones having a problem with sin? No. The, the uh, First and Second Corinthians, they were having a hard time with sin. If you ever try to go back there and read there again, uh, I believe First and Second Corinthians is a good example of someone who's newly saved, and they've got and God's got a lot of cleaning up to do in their life, and they're going to struggle with the flesh. They're going to struggle hardcore with giving up things, okay. But there, if you actually read it, they're trying to use they're trying to justify sin. Uh, sin's not a big deal, and that's what using liberty as an occasion for the flesh is. When you make sin not out to be a big deal anymore. I'm saved. Sin's not a big deal. I can live however I want as long as I believe in the big guy upstairs. How I many of you guys heard that before? Well, we're not supposed to judge ourselves or judge one another. It's just, you know, just love one another. Love, love. But no judging. Okay. Um, Galatians 5.14. Galatians 5.14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Okay, all the law is filled in one word, even this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It's talking about the law, uh, you have the law of sin and death, and then you have the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Remember what they tried to get, they tried to entangle Jesus. Tried to trip him up. And he said, what was the greatest commandment? And he says, the two, the greatest, two greatest commandments is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, body, and soul, I think is what it is. Body, soul, and spirit. Mind, body, and soul. And to love your neighbor as yourself. And here we see, that shall love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And turn back to, again, I did have it in my notes, Romans 8. Turn back to Romans 8. That you walk in the spirit, they shall not fulfill the laws of the flesh. And the biting and devouring one another, brothers of Christ, is us trying to correct one another and keep everybody on the straight and narrow path. Hey, what you're doing there is wrong. Hey, what that person's doing there is wrong. And we're all conflicting with others because you have us, some of us that give in and say, okay, I'll compromise. You have some of us that say, hey, I'm not compromising. You have division, division, division. And sin is a big issue. Worldliness comes in as a big issue. Okay? This false liberty causes more division than anything in the Bible. Because it makes you believe that, hey, we can have different stances, different viewpoints. We can agree to disagree. Different viewpoints. But the dividing and devouring one another is arguing over what is a sin is okay now. It's not a big issue. Who are you to judge me? Have you come across those types of people? You try to correct them with love? Out of the Bible, you try to correct them and say, hey, what you're doing there is wrong. And they try to devour you. Who are you to judge me? 
You're no better than me. You think you're holier than that? No, I have my faults. I have my struggles with sin too. But a brother comes and corrects me. I'm, not, I'm going to do my best not to devour him. My mentor, boy, does he devour people when they correct him. Truly correct him. Okay. I pray I never get that way, but I could. That's why i got to be vigilant. That's why we got to keep our eyes open. And make sure that we don't get that way. We don't become like that. But Romans 8, we're talking about this. When it says there, to walk in the Spirit and, the, and you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Wait, 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 wait. If, if this up there talking about a, a liberty is an occasion for the flesh, it's just taking things to an excess. This says fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. And it's going to get into what those lusts are. Okay. Not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. But let's talk about walking in the Spirit. Romans chapter 8. Chapter 1, therefore there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. That's right. If you fail the Lord in sin as a saved sinner, you're not going to go to hell for it. You're not going to lose your salvation. It's not yours to lose. Your salvation belongs to the Lord. You belong to the Lord. The Bible talks about you're bought with a price. Know you not that you're not your own? You're bought with a price. Right? You belong to God. Right? But sin no longer has dominion over you in the sense that you're not going to go to hell and burn for all eternity when you sin. Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price and fulfilled the law of sin and death. Therefore, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Who? This is just defining someone who's truly saved, the changed life. Who? Walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You can give in to the flesh sometimes and fail, but is your whole life just walking after the flesh? Are you worldly? Do you look like the world, act like the world? You might talk like the world. Or maybe you talk, you have a good talk, a good profession, but your walk, you look, you look and you, and you uh, walk like the world. You're acting like the world, but you have a good profession, of, you know, good words and fair speeches. Be careful, they need all three. Does you, do you still look like the world? No, that's good. Do you still talk like the world? No. Do you still act like the world? Doing things the world's way. Are you doing things God's way? You need to have all three of those checked out every day. Mm -hmm. Some people can deceive with their words, but their actions, they look and act like the world. Mm -hmm. The world's more important. Mm -hmm. But who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Okay. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. It's fulfilled in us. The, the outward showing that, that, that we're saved, that that righteousness is fulfilled in us, so that we walk... To walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Our heartfelt desire is to obey the Word of God. The Holy Spirit opens the Word of God, changes our life, and tells us how to live. And I'm telling you, in these last days, it's going to be 99.999% against what the world's doing and the direction the world's going in these last days. You're not going to be going that direction. If you start finding yourself going that direction here in your life, or this little area of your life, you need to work on it. I am. Okay? For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That's the whole reason you have a false teaching of liberty. It's because you have people that mind the flesh and then they turn around and try to make themselves feel good to justify the flesh through their false liberty. Okay. But they that are after the Spirit do, do the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And we've talked about this. I've got another reading I want to do by the fireplace with Psalms about King David, his attitude towards when he failed the Lord. You don't have peace. Mm -hmm. That love, it's there. God, I'm not saying God stops loving you, but life, there's life and peace. You don't feel like you have a real life. You feel like you just fail. Everything's falling apart when you give in to sin and wickedness. You lose that peace. You lose that joy. Mm -hmm. But when you're walking with the Spirit and you're doing right by the Lord and you're doing what's right and living right and doing things God's way, you have that life and you have that peace. Because the carnal mind, the carnal mind is enmity against God. 
For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Sin as a saved sinner does not please God. We're not supposed to be using liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Amen. Back to Galatians chapter 5, verse uh, 16. But remember what it said in 15, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you're praying a lot, when you're singing hymns a lot, when you're reading the Bible a lot, when you're studying the Bible a lot, when you take the Word of God and apply it to your life and get the wickedness out, get the temptations out, when you're walking after the Spirit, it helps you keep, stay away from the lust of the flesh. What happens when the lust of the flesh come in? They start putting the Spirit down. They start getting you away from the things that help you stay focused on the Lord. They keep, it, the, when the lust of the flesh come in, they keep you from reading the Word of God every day. They start getting in the way of your prayer life. Singing hymns. They start getting you to make compromises and letting things back in that you put out for the Lord. To live a godly life for the Lord. Amen. Okay. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. Here's the biggest example of why this is a false teaching when they say, oh, this is just talking about using things to an excess. No, it's talking about using liberty as justification to continue in sin. Yes, God saved you. Yes, you're not going to go to hell if you're truly saved and born again. You're not going to go to hell. But you're not to use liberty as an occasion for the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. There's that war there. It's always going to be there, brothers and sisters Christ. I pray that 90% of the time, the spirit, the capital S spirit, is, is winning in your life. And you got that 10%. But with some brethren, it could be 80-20. Some brethren, it could be 50-50. They're really struggling. Okay? But you got some out there that it's, it looks like 10% of the time the spirit's in charge, and 90% of the time the flesh is in charge. And the Bible talks about, I'm talking about for those who are truly saved and born again. God's going to chastise them, going to correct them. He's going to get them back on their feet. But remember what the Bible says, in the house of God, there's gold and silver, wood and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. But you need to check yourself, okay? You're never going to be 100% spiritually led. Those are, you can tell someone who's fake when they say, I'm 100% spiritually led, I'm sinlessly perfect, I'm just so great. That's someone who's a deceiver, a liar and a deceiver. Okay, that's why I said 90-10 is probably the best you're going to get, and that's a good thing. Okay. Okay. I want it, but your desire is to be 100. I'm sorry, but the desire is to be 100%, but you're not always going to be 100%. You're never going to be 100%. Not until we get rid of this wicked body of flesh, not until the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay. But the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other. There's a battle going on. So that ye cannot do the things ye would. Remember when Paul used to talk about that? That what I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, that I do. It's a struggle. He's talking about a struggle with the flesh. Okay? And over time, when you walk with the Lord and you get spiritually, God will teach you how. Because remember in that passage, what always trips me up, in that passage he's talking about, he says he doesn't know how to do that which is right. Yet, once you get saved, you don't. When you first get saved and you're spiritually, you're spiritually minded and you start walking after the Spirit, God's got a lot of cleaning up to do on your life. You don't know everything that's right and wrong in your life. God's going to start showing you things. He's going to start shining lights on things. You don't know how to do that, which is good. But if you keep walking in the Spirit, you keep studying the Word of God, you keep putting God's Word first, and you keep trying your best to live it, God will shine lights on areas of your life that's wrong and say, okay, clean this up. Okay, now it's time to clean this up. Okay, I put this off for a while. It was wrong from the beginning, but I put it off for a while. But now we're shining a light on this part of your life saying, hey, it needs to get cleaned up. All right? But that's what it's talking about. Do the things that you would. There's times that you give in to the flesh and you do something you didn't want to do. You compromised. You just gave up because of the fight and the struggle. There's times we just give up and give in. And then, uh, then you know, three steps later, we're like, okay, we're wrong. I'm sorry, Lord. Give me strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, put uh, you get it out of your life and you get back to walking with the Lord. Okay? Verse 18. 
But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Talking about the law of sin and death. You're not lost. You're not going to go to hell because you failed the Lord. But we're still supposed to have a zero tolerance for sin in our lives, brothers and sisters of Christ. We're not supposed to use liberty as an occasion for the flesh. How do we know that that's talking about sin? It's not talking about just using something to an excess. It's, it's something that's okay that's just used to an excess. No. It's talking about sin. How do we know this? Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Remember we just talked about the lust of the flesh, and then it's talking about the works of the flesh. They go hand in hand, compare scripture with scripture. It's still talking about the lust of the flesh, when it says the works of the flesh. Or manifest, which are these. Okay. Now in Galatians 5.13, which says, Liberty is an occasion for the flesh. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. Is that not sin? Yeah. Fornication. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness. Idolatry. Kicking people's lowercase t gods, like of Christmas, of their worldly way of wanting to live. Anything in this world, where they take it and they put it above the Lord, it becomes an idol. When it becomes before the Lord, it could be a husband, it could be a wife, it could be a best friend, it could be children, that you start putting your children first above the Lord of Lord, the Lord. Remember what Jesus said, if a man lo love mother or father more than me, he's not worthy of me. No, it says more. You can love your mother and father. But when push comes to shove, are you willing to put your all on the altar of sacrifice that's laid? Are you willing to sacrifice your mother and father to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? They don't want, like, I have a mother that wants nothing to do with the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. She's forbid me from preaching to her anymore. The gospel, the word of God. Do I, do I compromise so I can have my, a great, you know, not fellowship, but, you know, social hour with my mom? Or do I stick to the Lord Jesus Christ and keep serving Him? I've lost a wife because I put God first. I wasn't going to compromise. I did, though. I, I remember talking about it. There was times where I did in that marriage. But like I said, when you fail the Lord, you get back up and say, Okay, I'm sorry. I did that once. I failed. I'm not going to do it again. And I stood my ground. I stood for the Lord. And I lost my wife. I lost my daughter. I lost my parents. The Bible says, Jesus says, He that loveth mother or father more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Is it wrong to get married? No, please, brothers of Christ. Marriage is a good thing. It is. Having children is a good thing. Having moms and dads is a great thing, especially today. Okay, families need to be full. Bible way, we need a full family. We need mothers and fathers. Married, together, having children, a family, and raising their children in the admonition of the Lord, a godly home. But the whole point is, is when that becomes more important than the Lord, and, there's, and you start compromising to please your wife, you start compromising to please your children, I had a brother in Christ using that, that, that compromise to justify Christmas. Okay? Uh, the, wait, their car, some, people, some men really get into their cars, whether they're fast cars or whatnot, their toys, the two-wheelers, the four-wheelers, uh, Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, I'm pointing over here to my computer, video games. Okay. It can be whatever. There's a lot of things that can come into your life, not just people, but things that can come into your life and it becomes more important. Money is a big one. When you become so money-oriented, money-minded, that you start falling into the love of money. It's all about money i got to have that money. There's a lot of things that can come in that start becoming a lowercase g God. Idolatry. But that's a whole other study. But idolatry, it's sin, it's wickedness. Something becomes an idol. See, now there's something you can say when you take something to an excess. Okay. But more than anything is when you take anything and you put it before the Lord. That's when it becomes an idol. Okay? When something of this world is more important than your walk with the Lord. When something of this world is more important if you're a man in ministry than, you're, than, you're, than the ministry. It's more important than the ministry. You're willing to sacrifice the ministry so you can keep the world. You're willing to sacrifice fellowship with brethren. You're willing to sacrifice brethren so you can have the world. That thing that you're willing to sacrifice a brother in Christ over, or a sister in Christ over, that's an idol. It's become an idol. There's some times where we have to stand for the Word of God and we part, or we, have, we part ways. Because you're standing for the Word of God. But a lot of times I see the division in the body of Christ. 
is because someone's holding on to the world. One person's trying to hold on to this, or both of them are holding on to two separate things, both two separate idols that are clashing. But it's always there's an idol involved. Witchcraft. Isn't witchcraft sin and wickedness? Yes. Hatred. I love you, brother. And then it becomes, I hate you. Sometimes I wonder, please bear with me, Brother Scribe, sometimes I wonder when you have brethren that do that, that say, I love you, brother, and then six months to a year down the road, you have some kind of clash, some kind of disagreement, and it goes from I love you, brother, to I hate you, bro I hate you, you're not a brother? It makes me wonder if you even loved him to begin with. We just tend to say things to say things. It's just what we're, we're expected to say. I just say it, brother, because we're expected to say it, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I love you, brother, because it's just what's expected of us. But do you truly love your brother and sister in Christ? You see, people turn on each uh, on brethren with such hatred. Okay. Now, they don't understand. There's times where I, I I get very disappointed in some of the brethren because they're going the wrong direction. They've fallen. They've get, gotten back into sin and wickedness, and I hate wickedness, and I hate evil, and I hate sin. But I love that my brother and sister in Christ. I love them, and true love for them is preaching the truth to them, like I'm preaching here. Correction. Correcting a brother in Christ. When you see them going the wrong direction, you see them in sin, you correct them. But the Bible says, in meekness instructing those. You do it in meekness. Not out of pride and ego and bitterness and hate. Okay, hatred for the lost world. People say, well, it's okay to hate the lost world, isn't it? No. True love for the lost world is preaching Jesus Christ to them. All your lost neighbors and lost family members, have you preached Jesus Christ to them? Better get busy. You might be newly saved, but I'm talking about for those of us that have been saved for like, you know, 8, 10, 15, 20 years. That's true love for the lost world. We're not supposed to hate the lost world. We're supposed to show true love to them. Yes, they're the enemy, and they need to be treated like the enemy until they get saved. But true love for the lost world is preaching the gospel to them, preaching absolute truth to them. We're not supposed to have hatred towards people. Period. Okay. Variance. Variance. Emulations. Wrath. See, some people lose their temper a lot. Wrath. Strife. They're people that cause strife. They, the backbiting, the whispering, the railing for railing, the bearing false witness, this false liberty, the promoting a false liberty that we can agree to disagree. You know what happens when you agree to disagree? You have one, someone over here, you have someone over here. What did that do? That just caused division. Oh, no, 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 but we're agreeing. It doesn't matter that you agree to disagree. He's still over there, and you're still over here. You're separate. The Bible says we're all supposed to be one in Christ Jesus. We're all supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment. But you got brethren that have fallen in this trap of promoting strife. There can be differences in the body of Christ, but we can all still come together as one. That's, that's satanic. We all need to have no differences when it comes to the Word of God. And be careful, because they'll always try to run back to it. We all have to have the, fa sa we all have to have the same favorite color, right? That's world stuff. When, it's, when it comes to this, when it comes to God's Word, we're all supposed to be on the same page. Are you on, you know, Galatians chapter 4 or chapter 5 with me? Are you on the same page? Yeah. Seditions, heresies, false teachings to justify the flesh. You look out there, a lot of, almost all the false teachings I've come across out there, false gospels. Uh, it's all about justifying the flesh. It's all about controlling people through the flesh. Like you have people that are against eternal security. Why? Because they're trying to control the people through the flesh. Right? But heresies, most heresies, like I said, I've heard, is because someone's trying to justify the flesh. And in justifying the flesh, or justifying um, choosing the world's way over God's way. Right? Verse 21, envyings. Murders, drunkenness, isn't this all sins? Yeah. Revelings, and such like of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, the spiritual fellowship with the Lord. Like I said, when you start doing these things, 
You lose the joy that God gave you. You have this great joy. I'm saved now. God saved me. You lose that joy. You lose the peace. You lose your way. You're not really living, true living for the Lord. You're living for after the flesh. So you're not you're not showing a life of you're not showing that you're alive, a life. You, you should start acting like the world, the world that has no life whatsoever. Life and peace. When it talks about um, up there where it says devouring one another, it's talking about getting into fights over this stuff. First and Second Corinthians is a great example. Getting into fight over fornication. Some people, oh, it's not a big deal. You had it. No, I'm saved now. It's not a big deal because I'm saved now. Yes, it is still a big deal. And there's a big fight and there's contention. There's division. You know what brings division? This, the, I was going to do this in closing. I probably will again in the closing. This false liberty that brings in that promotes that there can be division in the body of Christ and it's okay. That's what brings most of the division, because then you have people that, I want to believe this over here, I want to believe that over there, and you have all this division, and yet you're told we can still come together and be one in Christ Jesus. Now, if you're truly saved and born again, we are one in Christ Jesus, but it doesn't mean we are living and acting like we're one in Christ Jesus, with all these different beliefs, and this, you know, trying to justify the flesh, perverting liberty to justify the flesh. Okay? You don't have to turn here, but Romans 13, 14 says, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You want a good walk with the Lord? You want to have that joy and that peace? And you want to have that strength that God can give you to live a life of Christ? That authority that God gives you over your flesh? You need to be following the Lord. You need to put on Jesus Christ. You need to be walking in the Spirit. Spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. Some people don't get that. People ask, well, do you still... I remember Peter Ruckman. I love Peter Ruckman, but one of his teachings, uh, one of my favorites where he's defending the Word of God, the King James Bible, is God's perfect written Word in English. He's talking about, uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he asked everybody, do you still sin? Well, then how do you explain that? Simple. When you sin, were you going through Jesus Christ? But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Were you going through Jesus Christ when you were sinning? Or were you going through the flesh? Were you doing things God's way? Or were you doing things your way? The world's way? That's why you failed. But if you were going through Jesus Christ, you would have had the strength. I can do all things through Christ. That's the key words there. Through Christ. And that's what I would have told Peter Ruckman if he was still here. He's in heaven right now. Through Christ. you got to put on Christ. Ephesians 2.3 Among whom also, you don't have to turn here, but Ephesians 2.3 Among all whom, among whom, also we all had our conversations in times past in the lust of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's how we used to be. Is that how we're supposed to be today? That's why he's saying up there, you're not to use liberty as an occasion for the flesh. Okay? Can you sin and still go to heaven as a saved sinner? Yes. Should you sin and go to a sin? No. We're supposed to do our best. To stay on that straight and narrow path. We're supposed to do our best to stick to the changed life. To do things God's way. 1 John 2.16 We read, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And then we get to the famous passage, Romans 12.2. Romans 12.2 I call it famous, but it's one of the memory verses, one of the early ones that I had memorized when I when it was first. And it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. And perfect will of God. And be not conformed to this world. Okay. We're in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world anymore. 
We're supposed to have a zero tolerance for this wicked world and the direction that it's going. And we have a zero tolerance, not with just our words, but the life that we're living. Okay? Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. That's how you prove the life that you're living. Action. It's not words. Remember what I said, brothers and guys. Words and deeds need to line up. Your actions need to line up with your words. Your life needs to line up with your words. If, you, if they don't, you're a hypocrite. And I've been a hypocrite sometimes. Okay, where my life didn't line up with my words. Okay? Be careful with that. Don't be a hypocrite. Make sure your life lines up with your words. Be not conformed to this world. And 1 John 2, 15. The other one that we already mentioned earlier. 1 John 2, 15. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The love of the Father is not in him. You're not supposed to be... Leave, the flesh is not supposed to be in charge, brothers of Christ. You're not supposed to use liberty to give authority and power back to the flesh to be in charge. To just sin all you want. That's not why you were given that liberty. That liberty Jesus died for you so that you could live right and serve Him. And that He could come into your life by the Holy Spirit and empower you to have a walk with Him, but empower you to overcome this wicked body of flesh and put it down and live a life of Christ. That's why he got, you got that liberty. Okay? That's, the, that's why the Bible talks about, Paul says, prove your own selves. He's dealing with people who don't look like they're saved, they don't talk like they're saved, they don't act like they're saved. The life that they're living isn't the life of a saved sinner. They look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world. And he's like, prove your own selves. Check whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Where's the changed life? Where's that heartfelt sorrow and conviction for the sin and wickedness that you're doing? If you're doing it. I'm talking about in that passage, there was a lot of wickedness going on. A lot of wickedness going on in First and Second Corinthians. Check whether you be in the faith. He doubted their salvation. Why? Because so many of them were using liberty as an occasion for the flesh. Well, I'm saved now. I can sin all I want. I just got a free pass to sin all I want. No, you did not. You need to check whether you be in the faith. That's not the attitude of someone who's truly saved. They don't have an attitude that I can sin all I want. They have an attitude of, Lord, help me. I failed you, Lord. I'm sorry. Help me stay on the straight and narrow. I don't want sin in my life. If it's wrong, show me it's wrong and help me get it out of my life, Lord. Go back to, oh, we'll start, we're still in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. We just read about what the works of the flesh are. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is someone who's walking after the Spirit. It's not hate. Love. Joy. Peace. When you're walking after the Spirit, you have love for your brother and sister Christ. Even in correcting them, there's love there. Okay? Even in, you know, they're falling down and you're trying to help get them back up. There still needs to be love there in how you do it. Meekness. Okay. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. That this is right. Like I said, a lot of the brethren that I know that, per, that teach a perverted um, liberty, they change this. They turn God's truth into a lie. They, uh, they start coming out with teachings that, that go against the scriptures. They start perverting the word of God. They start taking verses out of context. I know a man turned his back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ. He's not looking, present tense, for that blessed hope. He doesn't have his eyes on Jesus Christ anymore. He has it on to his life down here. Because his life down here is more important. His possessions, what he has, his dream life is more important. And I, I've been there. I've made that mistake. Brothers of Christ, don't make that mistake. This life, there's no, nothing down here that's more important than your walk with the Lord. There's nothing down here that's more important than being a servant to a brother and sister in Christ. 
Nothing. Uh, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Going back to the law of sin and death. Okay, the law of sin and death have no... That's what makes such... Because some people take that as against such... So I'm not under any law. No, you're under the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. You're under the law of God. You belong to Jesus Christ now. He commands, you obey. But he's talking about the difference between someone who's saved versus someone who's lost. Someone who's under the law of sin and death and someone who's just under the law of sin. Someone who's under the law of sin and death versus someone who's under the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is no such law. The law of sin and death has no power over someone who's in Christ Jesus our Lord, who has the Holy Spirit in him. Remember, if he that has the Spirit, if he hath not the Spirit in him, he's none of his. In Romans 8, when it's contrasting those who are walking after the carnally minded walking after the flesh, spiritually minded walking after the spirit, and it says they that have not the spirit, they don't have that Holy Spirit in them, they're none of his. And this is the fruits of the spirit. Do they display these? They can fail the Lord sometimes, and, and some of these they can fail them. But predominantly do they should they, they reflect these? 24. And they that are Christ. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts the changed life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He's a new creature. The changed life. You start putting the flesh down as a saved sinner. You don't let the flesh just go run rapid and then say, Oh, it's under the blood. I've come across all of those fake converts, those false converts. It's just under the blood. It's under the blood. I can live however I want. Who are you to judge me? How dare you judge me? You're no better than me. You're just a sinner just like I am. How dare you? They won't take correction. They're not putting their flesh down. They're not crucifying their flesh. And they that are Christ have crucified their flesh with the affections and lusts. Verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, capital S Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. It's not just supposed to be talk. It's also supposed to be walk. Okay. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Don't get stuck on, hey, I might have, like, I've already, uh, uh, I've already expressed my faults. From the moment I got saved, here's my faults. Everyone has their own addictions that they struggled with. Mine, when I first got saved, was Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, and porn. That's where my addictions when I first got saved. Everyone has their... Some people might be drunkards. Some people might be drug addicts. Some people might be fornicators. Which, the Bible says, if you've done it here, then you've done it. Just because you haven't done the physical act doesn't mean you haven't fornicated. So, But the point is, is we all have our addictions and our faults. Okay? I might not struggle with um, alcohol, drunkenness. I did, I did get drunk a few times in the past and cut off alcohol completely in my life. But right now, present tense, I have no problem with alcohol as far as drunkenness. I don't have it in my life at all. Someone who's newly saved that's a drunkard might look at me and go, he just thinks he's better than me because he doesn't get drunk like I do. And vice versa, there's some brethren I know, brothers and sisters in Christ, that never had a problem with Hollywood movies and TV shows and video games. They just want nothing to do with them. They've, they've never been addicted. They want nothing to do with them. I'm not supposed to look at them, oh, they just think they're better than me because they don't get addicted. We're not supposed to be envying one another. We all have our struggles. We all have our faults. And where I am weak, you might be strong. And where you're weak, I might be strong. Iron sharpens iron, the Bible talks about. We sharpen one another. We encourage one another. Where I'm strong in an area of my life, I can strengthen you. And where you're strong in an area where I'm weak, you can strengthen me. That's, that, that goes hand in hand with true fellowship, brothers, this Christ. We sharpen one, we correct one another, we hold each other accountable, but we strengthen one another. That's how it's supposed to be, okay? We're not supposed to be envying one another, provoking one another. And it's not provoking to call a brother in Christ sin out. It's not provoking. It becomes provoking when you do it publicly versus privately. You're supposed to go to a brother and sister in Christ privately first. And talk to them. A whole other study, but we have brethren. That's another thing that causes a lot of problems in the body of Christ. We don't go and talk to one another. 
I'll, I'll mention his name, Brother Brian and I. I started having problems with him, and I didn't go talk to him. He started having problems with me, and he didn't come talk to me. He refuses to talk to anybody one on one. It seems not. I can't say that indefinitely, but it just seems like it sometimes when there's when there's conflict, when there's a disagreement, when you feel like you've been wronged by a certain brother in Christ or sister in Christ, do you go talk to them one on one? Or do you hold it inside until it explodes and then you start doing things to provoke one another? And I did. I screwed up. I, I provoked Brother Brian by saying something in a study. I took the study down. Okay, I should have went and talked to him one on one. And then I did afterwards. I tried to anyways. I tried to afterwards. But he wouldn't talk. Well, that's a bad thing. That leads to provoking one another. Then it starts leading to envying one another. Be careful about that. Make sure your fellowship, that's what true fellowship is. Talking to one another. And about the Lord, about His Word, about what's right, about what's wrong. Encouraging and strengthening one another. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. That's talking about salvation. But there's another passage that says, If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. That is the physical. Present tense physical. Even if you're saved, if you continue to live after the flesh, you continue to try to use liberty as an occasion for the flesh, you will die. You won't go to hell, but your life on this earth is going to be short. It's going to be miserable, and you're going to mess yourself up. Especially drinking. You get drunk a lot. It's going to mess you up. Smoking. Uh, fornication. You know. This stuff here is messing your head up. Uh, mess, uh, Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games. Messing your head up. Hurting your eyes if you're behind a screen all the time. It'll start hurting your eyes. Even if you're wearing special glasses, it's still going to hurt your eyes. Okay. Over time, if you're spending too much time here and not enough time just looking out, one of the exercises I have to do is I have to look at something at a distance. Okay, I've got a little bit of a view of the mountainside going down to the ocean, just a small view of the ocean, and I try to look out at a distance and I spend hours out there looking out and talking with the Lord, listening to God's Word, singing hymns, but my view is trying to look out. If you get so stuck with stuff so close, I'm not saying don't read the Word of God, but you need to be doing both. You need to be looking out at the distance. One thing we don't tend to do a lot anymore with television and television is we got the screen right here in the front of our face. People got their phones and they got their phones, especially the small phones trying to watch movies on their phones and stuff like that. Now I don't need TV more. I got my phone and it's right here and they're, and they're not spending a lot of time looking out at a distance. Okay? But you live after the flesh, you shall die. It's also, but when we just read there, it's going to, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It's going to get in the way of your walk with the Lord. As we just read there about contentions and striving amongst yourself, your flesh is going to get in the way of your fellowship with the brethren. If you're a man of ministry, it's going to get in the way of your ministry. Oh yeah. 1 Corinthians 3.11 1 Corinthians 3.11 Keep your hands there. 1 Corinthians 3.11 For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus becomes your foundation. Either Jesus is your foundation or your flesh is your foundation. You can't have both. You can fail the Lord, but you can't have both. This fake gospel going out, only believe, only believe. There's no repentance. There's no confessing both your repentance and belief in prayer and asking God to save you. There's no changed life after salvation. You just continue living like the world, looking like, and just say, I believe in the big guy upstairs. This false teaching of easy believism. Okay? is teaching you that your flesh can still be the foundation. The world can still be your foundation. Because that's what the world offers you, is your flesh. Things that please your flesh. The world can still be your foundation. No. For, there, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If you're in Christ Jesus, if any man be in Christ, you're going to have, have a, a changed life. 
You're going to be a new man. The old man is dead and buried. The old woman is dead and buried. The new man is raised with Christ. The new woman is raised with Christ. You're going to start living a life of Christ. You're going to start living for the Lord. And it's going to set you apart from this wicked world. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work sh shall be made manifest, for the day will declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. See, people think, I'm saved now. I don't have to do anything else. Okay, now we're, working on, we're worrying about the judgment seat of Christ. We're keeping our eyes on eternity. Remember, things that are eternal versus things that are temporal. We're supposed to be earning rewards in heaven that get to stay with us throughout all eternity. It's not, we just get saved, I'm done. No, no, no. He that beareth their punch shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, burned. You know the times that you got gave into the flesh, started being worldly, started mistreating the brethren, started abusing your authority in ministry, started doing things the world's way, your way, failing the Lord. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet as so by fire. What is that? That's liberty. If you truly are saved and born again, you have liberty. You can fail the Lord. You can see a lot of your works get burnt up at the judgment seat of Christ, but you shall be saved as so by fire. Jesus said it is finished before he died on the cross. If you're truly saved and born again, you went through the cross, you have liberty. You are saved. You're born again. You've been liberated from the law of sin and death. You can fail the Lord, like I said, you can be one of the dishonor, part of the house of God. You're the dishonor. You're the wood and earth. A lot of your work, works there can be the wood, hay, and stubble. But you're still going to go to heaven. Eternal security is absolute truth. Don't let anybody deceive you on that. But like I said before, you can be saved and God still wants you to doubt your salvation because you're not living like a saved person. Okay? You're, and I've told people that there's times where I, I believe this person's saved, but I'll drop, fall back to preaching the gospel to them. If it gets that bad, I will fall back to preaching the gospel to them. Not because I don't believe he's saved, because I believe he's forgotten who it is that saved him, why they got saved, why they needed to get saved, what they were saved from. Okay, This body of flesh is not supposed to be in charge anymore. But you have some brethren that are starting to fall back into their old ways. They're trying to resurrect the old man. Right? Uh, turn back to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Right? What does it mean to not use liberty as an occasion for the flesh? It's talking about sin. Yes, you have liberty. Yes, you've been freed from the law of sin and death. Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price that you don't have to pay now because he paid it at the cross. But it doesn't justify you sinning anymore still. Just because you're not going to go to hell for sinning doesn't mean sin's now okay. There's still a price to be paid for sin for you. And that price is that we just read it. It's at the judgment seat of Christ. Your good works versus your bad works. Sin. Worldliness. Disobedience to God. They're both going to get weighed at the judgment seat of Christ. The ultimate price of sin, Jesus paid. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. But the judgment seat of Christ, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. We're still under the law of sin. We're still going to be held accountable someday for our life as a Christian. Are you living a life of Christ? Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... You which are spiritual, restore, restore such one in the spirit of meekness. There it is again. I, I don't know why the brethren, I think today brethren love drama. I mean, on here you get, some people's ministries become drama ministries. 
They become like those talk shows and the TV shows, you know. It, the world loves drama, drama, drama. They love conflict. They love going after each other and just like a knife. Trying to... Brethren, if a man be overtaken with a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Where's the meekness in the body of Christ today? Today, when, they, when you see someone's at fault, it just seems like we want to tear each other apart. We're not supposed to be like that. In the spirit of meekness, you can speak with authority and still have meekness. Some brethren don't seem to get that. They think in order to speak with authority is to yell. Okay, we got to yell at the camera. we got to yell at the camera. No, you can raise your voice when you're being stern. But I'm talking about some of them just yell at the camera. That's not meekness. Okay. You're losing your calm. You need to turn the camera off and you need to go take a walk with the Lord and talk with the Lord and calm down. Then come back and talk to the brethren. Okay. And meekness. Okay. Consider thyself, lest thou be, thou also be tempted. Consider thyself. One of the things I always try to tell the brethren when I'm talking to them, um, when it comes to faults, like I just said, I have my faults, you have your faults. My faults might not be your faults. So while I am strong in one area and I'm trying to correct you, I need to remember that I might be strong in the area where you're weak, but I have weaknesses where you're strong. Okay? In other words, I have faults too. I'm here to correct your fault, but I understand I have faults too. You have some people that they get so prideful and, and calling out your fault, they act like they're sinlessly perfect. I get that. I understand that. It's not wrong to correct. But when you start correcting to the point where you're like that um, Pharisee and the publican, that Pharisee, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not like other men are. You know, this publican. I don't have the problems that this publican has. But you have problems, right? Well, no, no, we don't talk about my problems. I just don't have the problems that this publican has. No, it, the whole point is you need to remember that, hey, you're a sinner too. There's times where you failed the Lord. How you treat the brethren is so important, brothers and sisters of Christ, especially in these last days. And meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You do it with love. What's the intent when you correct somebody, brothers and sisters of Christ? It's not to destroy them. If you're yelling at them, if you're, if you're uh, calling them names and bearing false witness, saying railing for railing, you're trying to tear them down and you're trying to destroy them. Is that how we're supposed to be? No. We tear the bad things down so that they can be built back up. My whole goal when I correct a brother in Christ is to build them back up. To help grab them and pull them back up to a standing position so they can start walking with me again. Okay, that's why we correct. If you don't want them to change, you just want them to look bad, what's the point in correcting them? Are you a politician? We just want them to look bad. We just want them to look bad. Where's the love? Where's the meekness? It's not there. A lot of people are just trying to destroy one another. It's not how we're supposed to be. And Paul's saying, hey, that's not how it's supposed to be. Remember, and when you do it, like I said, always when you're correcting somebody, remember, 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 hey, I might get corrected. I might need correction. How I go about correcting him is how I want to be corrected. Nobody likes someone just yelling at them to the point where it's like they're spitting in their face. I've been yelled at to the point where the guy was like spitting in my face. Nobody likes that. So why are you doing it? Not you personally, everybody, but there's brethren out there that will yell at the camera. There are brethren out there that will yell at one another and just turn and run the other way. Just forsake brethren like that. Where's the love? Okay. Two, bear ye one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Help one another. Be there for one another. Today, I think one of the biggest dangerous things for us today right here, I'm not saying it's wrong to make videos. I make videos and put them out Bible studies. But to have your whole fellowship life on the internet, I'm pointing over here at the computer, on the internet, I think it's very bad. We need to get back to that face-to-face -face fellowship. We need to get back to doing house churches. But it's going to cost, it's going to take... It's going to take sacrifice for us to start coming together in different areas of the world and start forming house churches. Get back to that face-to-face -face fellowship. Get back to that being able to strengthen one another and bear one another's burdens. 
Anybody who try, that gets behind the camera and says, oh, I'm bearing your burdens and oh, I'm here for you guys, they're just, they're, they're after this. They're after this. Okay? There is no true fellowship online. Okay? You cannot see how someone else is living online. You can have a lot of, all online is is talk, 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 talk. You never get to see the walk. Ever. Even with me behind the camera, you don't get to see my walk. Now, I'm not saying I'm evil and deceiving, but I'm saying you don't get to see my walk. I would love to have a house church or be part of one. Even if it means just going and sitting down. I don't do any teaching. I, I, I just go in there, sit, sing some hymns, pray with them. Uh, we confess our faults one another. We strengthen one another. We carry one another's burdens. I would do that in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. We need to get back to the face-to-face -face fellowship, which is another issue. But bear you one another's burden, so fulfill the law of Christ. You can't do that online. And it's not talk about just financial burden. Yes, you can throw money at people to help them out. Or well, they need a bill paid. Uh, they need this. There's that. But we need to be more than just throwing money. Okay? If all you are is throwing money, or you see a ministry, it's all about just taking money in, and they're not actually physically there for the brethren. Making videos isn't being physically there. Okay? Especially if you get paid for it. But the point is, is we need to get back to being there physically for one another. Holding each other accountable. True fellowship. Face-to-face -face fellowship. I've got a thing we haven't done yet. We might do it in the future. A study that I kind of put together about Paul. What was Paul's reaction? Did he write letters? Yeah, he wrote letters. Well, emails are the same as letters, right? But in all his letters, his heartfelt desire was to be there face-to-face. He, he didn't want to have to write a letter. He wanted to be able to say what he had to say face to face. His heartfelt desire was to be face to face with the brethren in fellowship. But you have some men that their desire is to say as far from the brethren as possible and be on camera and be all talk. Talk, 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 talk. Oh yeah, be careful of those people. Verse 3, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, remember the Pharisee, something when he's nothing, versus the Sadducee. Okay. He deceiveth himself. When I go to correct somebody, I realize, hey, I'm just a, I'm a sinner like he is. I have my faults like I'm here to correct him on his fault. Okay. Don't make yourself above them. I'm better than them. Get that pride. You get that arrogance. You get that ego. Okay. And then it leads to bitterness and envy. Verse 4. But let every man prove his own work. There it is, the outward showing work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Okay, when God gives you victory over your faults, that's where you rejoice. You don't have envy when God gives people rejoicing, uh, gives people victory over their faults. Okay, I will rejoice with you, but I'm not going to get envious. We're not supposed to. We're supposed to be rejoicing over how God overcomes our lives and gets our life, each individual brother and sister in Christ's life online, in line. When we say, okay, God got this out of my life, praise the Lord. God got that out of my life, We need to be focusing on our walk with the Lord and our walks. If your walk was with the Lord, my walk's with the Lord, we're going to come closer together. When you start going to the right or you start going to the left, my walk's not going to, our walk's not going to be together. Mm -hmm. But it says, every man shall be, bear his own burdens. And not in another. For every man shall bear his own burdens. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Okay, we're supposed to have people, men teaching other men. We're supposed to have men standing up in Bible preachers, Bible teachers, teaching the word of God. Okay, Teaching the good things. We're supposed to have that. Okay. 2 Timothy 2.24 2 Timothy 2.24 And the servant of the Lord must not strive. There's brethren out there that they call striving. They like uh, the drama. They like the backbiting, the whispering, uh, the gossip, the name calling, the mocking. Now, I understand I try not to be sarcastic hardly, but there's some times where I slip up and I do say something sarcastically, but I try not to be sarcastic because we're supposed to be preaching the, the Word of God in truth, the Bible says, and in sincerity. 
in sincerity and truth. We're sincere. This is serious. It's not something we're supposed to be uh, making light of, okay? Being sarcastic. But I failed sometimes and been sarcastic. Okay, but the Lord, the servants of the Lord must not strive. But be gentle unto all men. All men. Not just saved. All men. Like I said, what's true love for the lost world? Preaching truth to them. There's men around here. I have neighbors who just flat out reject the Lord. I have a neighbor up here that just mocks Jesus Christ. He got mad at me once to the point where he was almost like he was spitting in my face. And I'm walking by and he says, I need help moving something. I help him move something. I'm not mean to him the way he is to me. We're supposed to be gentle all the men. Remember, we're not supposed to reward evil with evil. But overcome evil with good. Am I going to invite that guy into my home? No. Am I going to invite him over for dinner and party and everything? No. Not that I party, but you know what I'm saying? No. But if I'm walking by and that man needs help, I'm going to help him. I've given that man food before. Okay. But this is Christ. We're supposed to be gentle unto all men. You can be angry. I, I, I had a brother in Christ who misused that verse. Can you be angry with the cause? Absolutely. Are you supposed to act out on that anger? No. You're, you're supposed to go talk with the Lord and let the Lord calm you down so that when you, whoever you're angry with, with a cause, you can go talk to them and you can reach them with the truth. Okay? Must be gentle all men, apt to teach. Okay, the elder women are to teach the younger women good things. There's a list of it. The elder men are to teach the young men, but the elder men are also supposed to teach the whole body of Christ, the Word of God. We're supposed to be apt to teach. The fathers should be teaching their family, raising their family in the admonition of the Lord. They should be teaching the family the Word of God. And if you don't know the Word of God, you need to get into the Word of God and start studying it so you know it to be able to teach it to your family. Okay? Apt to teach. Patient. You have to be patient with people. It might take a while for someone to come around. Am I falling away with Brother Brian? I call him a brother. I'm patient. I'm waiting for him to come around to the truth. God will bring him to the truth. It might take a year. It might take ten years. If we're still here. That is, if we're still here. But I'm waiting for him to come around. I'm waiting for him to drop his pride and his ego and his bitterness and come talk to me. I'm here. All right. 25, uh, but patient. We need to learn to be patient and not be in a hurry, not be impatient. Verse 25, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. In meekness. I've always told people, if you yell at someone, a wall comes up. They turn this off, their ears. They stop listening to you. They hear you, but they stop listening to you. When you're yelling at them, when you're calling them names, when you're mocking them. They, won't, they, they hear you, but they won't listen. You're supposed to do it in meekness. Why? Because in meekness, they might not hear you the first time. Or they might not hear you, but they listened. You sowed a seed. That seed comes down. It's planted. It's there. They walk away. I, I don't want to hear you. I don't want to hear you. But they listen. And it starts bugging them. The conviction starts setting in. That seed doesn't get planted if it's not done in meekness. Okay? If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That's what I pray for myself, for Brother Brian, for all my brothers and sisters in Christ out there. That God will open our eyes to the truth and make sure that we're making sure that our priorities are right and that we're doing things God's way. Okay? Verse 26, and that, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. When you have brethren that start falling into world, falling into temptation and choosing to sin, they get back into worldliness and doing things the world's way. Who's the lowercase g God of the world? Satan. They're taken in a snare by Satan. Got to get them out of the hands of Satan and get them back to doing what God wants them to do, back to doing things God's way. Sorry for the long roundabout thing, but brother says Christ, what is liberty? Using liberty as an occasion of the flesh. Sin. Trying to justify sin now that we have liberty, we can sin all we want. 
And can you believe you've had brethren kick me for this, saying, you're wrong, you're wrong. You're saying God's wrong? You're saying the Word of God is wrong? See, their problem's with this, not with me, with the Word of God. It just said the lust of the flesh, or the, the works of the flesh are these, and the lust of the flesh. So it mentions lust of the flesh, then works of the flesh, and it talks about sin. We're not supposed to use liberty as an occasion of the flesh, because you can start getting back in, I'll say this, you can start getting back into a sin that I gave up, and you can start throwing something in my face that's sinful and wicked. I'll give you an example. Christmas. I gave up Christmas. I had a brother in Christ that kept promoting Christmas like it's okay, it's no big deal. I gave it up for the Lord. Stop tempting me. I know it's wrong. You ain't gonna lie to me about it. I know it's wrong. I've proven it's wrong. Right? Uh, Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games. There was a group, a uh, couple that kept coming on doing talk shows. Um, and um, way back, like years ago. And they were mentioning how, uh, you know, some movies are okay, Hollywood movies are okay, and some video games can be okay, and, you know, some secular music can be, like, uh, uh, satanic style music can be okay. And, and I gave all that stuff up for the Lord. Stop tempting me. You know how that causes division? What Paul's talking about here, where you have fighting among the brethren. Hey, get that away from me. I gave it up. I don't want anything to do with it. Did God command you to do that? No, get them rid. And if it's offending the brethren, get rid of it. No, no, Christmas is more important. Christmas is more important than fellowship with the brethren. That's some people's attitude. It's not just Christmas. Video games. I've lost fellowship with brethren because they chose video games or fellowship with the brethren. I've lost fellowship with people, Brother Brian, one of them, because he chose Christmas over fellowship with the brethren. He perverted liberty to justify the life that he wants to live. Those other people with the video games, they would always hit me up saying, you're a liberty thief, you're a liberalist. Because they had to have a perverted liberty to justify the sin that they were doing. Now, my ex-wife, she was a drunkard. Okay. And she wouldn't use the word liberty, but she would say that I'm saved and it's under the blood. She was basically saying, I have liberty. Who are you to judge me? I'm a man of God. That's who I am to judge you. People today will use those two things. I'm going to wrap all three parts together, okay? Galatians 6, 7. Okay. All three parts that we did in this study, we're going to wrap it up together real quick. Galatians 6, 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Those of you out there that pervert what true liberty is, being liberated from the law of sin and death, what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And because he bought us, and we were paid for with a price, the Bible says, feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. We were bought with the price. We belong to Jesus Christ. We are not our own. He commands. We obey. It's not I get to choose and do things my I can choose how I want to do things and do things my way in the world. We're to do things God's way. Those of you who have perverted liberty out there, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For those of you out there who keep trying to use liberty as an occasion for the flesh, oh, it's under the blood, while you're present tense sinning. You're right. Someone who, who sins, repents, forsakes, and gets back to their walk, walk with the Lord, you're not going to go to hell and burn for all, all eternity for those who are truly saved. It is bought. It, the ultimate price is paid. But someone who's present tense in sin, and they're using that statement to justify sin, God is not mocked. He sees right through you. Eight. For what? For he that soweth to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall uh, soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be wary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap. Talking about the judgment seat of Christ. The casting away of the body of Christ, getting a new body. We shall reap if, if we faint not. Verse 10. 
As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Do you see that happening a lot lately, Brothers of Christ? No, everyone has their own group. You got you got the people over here in this group. You got the people over in this group. But we're all we're all Christians. We're all saved. And you got this group over here. That group. We have so many different groups scattered. We're not treating each other like we're all the household of faith. But this false teaching says we can be separate of, of liberty. We can be separate yet come together. We're, we're all one. No, but we're not acting it. We're not acting it. We're not living it. We all need to be of the same mind and the same judgment when it comes to the Word of God. There sh we should not have any hope disagreements. People say, well, you're going to have them. Yeah, that's when the flesh gets involved. That's what causes the disagreements, the flesh. I'm sorry, I point at the heart. The flesh, okay, this wicked body of flesh. But our heartfelt desire is, I want to be lined up with the Bible, and I want to be one in Christ Jesus, and we all need to come together and strive together. Verse 11, you see how large a letter I have written unto you. Galatians is large. See how large a letter I have written unto you with my own hand. Brother, sister of Christ, we have Bible studies. I've had, look at how many Bible studies. I'm not patting myself on the back. I know there's brethren out there that have way more Bible studies out there than I have. They've been in ministry a lot longer than I have. But the point is, is we have these videos out here. Why? For, because we just feel like it. Some are doing it for this. Getting that money, getting that paycheck. But some of us are doing it because we love the brethren. Paul's saying, look how large a letter I've written with my own hand. That's how serious this is, but that's how much I love you guys. I want to see you guys do right. I want to see you succeed in Jesus Christ. Verse 12, I want to see you get a lot of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 12, as many as I desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Remember in part one when we talked about this, when you get liberated from the law of sin and death, in order to fulfill the law of sin and death, there's two ways to fulfill it. You have to keep all God's laws, period. All the laws of God that are written on your heart circumcision, the laws of Moses. They always say the laws of Moses, but it's the laws of God that were given to Moses. Okay? You have to keep all those to fill the law. That's one way. The other way is you fall on your knees before Jesus Christ and say, I'm not capable. I've already failed. I'm not capable of keeping the law of sin and death. Lord, you did. You fulfilled the law of sin and death. Save me. And God will save you. Okay, repentance. I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell because I've broken the law, God's law. I've sinned against God. Oh, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. They're getting back into the law, but there's people that when you get saved, they try to get you back under the law. That's when they come to spy out your liberty. Like I said, anytime someone says it's a liberty issue, it's a salvation issue. When they come and tell you that what Jesus Christ did on the cross isn't enough. That was part one. What Jesus Christ did on the cross. No, part one was just to talk about the false con uh, liberty. Part two, sorry. Part two of this study was talking about what true liberty is. Is what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. I don't have to go through the law of sin and death to be saved. To get saved. Okay? To have that seal. Okay, you're sealed until the day of redemption. To have that seal, I don't have to go through the laws. But there's some people that try to bring you back in, under traditions of men, under laws, in order to be saved. And they take away from what Jesus Christ did for you. And this is what Paul's talking about here. Constrained to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. That's why he got under, uh, Paul got unto Peter. Peter didn't want to suffer persecution from the Jews, so he withdrew himself and treated those Gentiles as if they were lost because they weren't circumcised. It became a salvation issue. It's not culture, a culture issue. That's a lie from someone who's trying to justify the flesh. He'll pervert the Bible to try to keep his worldliness. Verse 13, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, 
but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, 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 brothers and sisters, Christ, what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. By whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature that changed life. The Holy Spirit coming in. You being sealed into the day of redemption, you're bought with the price. Jesus is now in charge. He commands, and your heartfelt desire is to want to obey. Sometimes you fail Him and you don't. But your heartfelt desire is you want to obey. And you do your best. And when you fail, you repent, you forsake, and you get back to your walk with the Lord. There's nothing in this world that's more important than the Lord. There's nothing in this world that's more important than His Word. There's nothing in this world that's more important than being a servant to the body of Christ in true fellowship. Sorry about that. There's nothing more important. Okay. Verse 16. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel, upon the Israel of God. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. His walk, how he lives, he bears the marks of Jesus. If you, you don't have to go out of your way to get persecuted. If you're living a life of Christ and you're standing for this book and you're standing for God's way and the real Jesus Christ, you're going to get persecuted. You're going to suffer persecution. But he's also, he's talking about the marks in his body. He's talking about putting down the old man. The old man is crucified with Christ. Remember when Jesus is raised from the dead? Uh, one of the apostles said, unless I see the holes in his hands, I won't believe. But Paul is saying is he's got the scars of crucifying the old man. The old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ. Okay. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. There's, you're going to have some scars for, for standing for the Lord in the life that you live, standing for his word in the life that you live. There's going to be scars. Verse 18, brethren... In other words, I know people that, um, I'll example real quick. When Jesus said uh, that a prophet is without honor except in his own country, I had people that knew who I was when I was lost. And no matter how much I try to talk to them, all they can see in me is the scars of my past life, my old, the old man. And I keep praying that since I can't reach them, maybe God, I pray, Lord, send somebody else their way that they will listen to. There's men like, I, I'll, I'm will i going to bring up his name again, Brother Brian Denlinger, when it used to be King James Video Ministries. I pray that God will bring someone his way that he will listen to, because he won't listen to me. Okay? He just won't. But you're going to have people out there that they're going to see their scars of your past life. They're going to see you for the old man and they can't see you as anything else. Mainly it's going to be your family, like your mother, your father, brothers and sisters. My daughter, I had a hard time with my daughter because I got saved when my daughter was old enough to remember things and she remembered who I was as a lost man. I gave up a lot of things in my life that she couldn't understand saying, hey, you used to do it. You didn't have a problem doing it before. What's the big deal? It's hard for some people. Okay. Verse 18, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Brothers, that's my prayer, that the Lord be with you, Brothers Christ. Brothers Christ, are you looking? Are you looking? Sound doctrine when it comes to liberty. If you're looking for Jesus Christ, then you're going to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross and understand what true liberty is. When you take your eyes off Jesus Christ and put it on the world, on your flesh in the world, you're going to start perverting what true liberty is. You're going to make liberty out to be a choice. You're going to take, take away what Jesus Christ did for us and make it out to be what you're doing. Liberty is what I'm doing. It's me having a choice. No, it isn't. Liberty is what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And now that you are saved, you are not to be using liberty as an occasion for the flesh. Sin. You're not supposed to use the fact that I'm saved now. I'm justified in any and every sin that I do. No. 
there's still a physical consequence down here on the earth. There's still a, we still have to, we're going to be held accountable at the judgment seat of Christ for our life as a Christian, the sin and the good. All right. So brothers and sisters of Christ, please, please, please keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Don't use liberty as an occasion for the flesh. Okay, if you still got some sins in your life, God will give you the strength if you go through Him to get that sin out of your life. If you've fallen back, if you start backpedaling, I have so, uh, so many, I, I, my whole life, brothers and sisters, there's little things here and there that I backpedal and then I get out, get rid of. Then I backpedal and I get It's a struggle. And it's, it's, we're going to be struggling with sin until the day we die. We, we're still having to deal with this body of wicked flesh. Our soul's redeemed, our spirit's redeemed, but this body of flesh hasn't been redeemed yet. We're supposed to be looking for that catching away, okay? If we faint not, don't faint, don't falter. The Bible talks about stand, 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 brothers and sisters Christ, stand, stand, stand. Okay? Don't use liberty as an occasion for the flesh, like the easy believism, okay? Who reject true repentance, biblical repentance, okay? Don't... Pervert liberty to justify sin and wickedness, brothers and sisters of Christ. Don't do it. Okay? And by all means, don't sacrifice brethren, your walk with the Lord and the brethren, so you can have sin for a season. That you can live the life that you want to live and do things your way. It's not worth it. Do things God's way. Make sure God's coming first, His Word's coming first, and the brethren come second. I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you, brothers and Christ, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next study.